My name is John Fiedler. So I work at Relate IQ. It's a very, very small uh, CRM. Um, we, last year, were acquired by uh, Salesforce. So now we're actually a Salesforce company, which is exciting. Um, when I was approached to do the talk here, is, uh, I was really excited because uh, they're asking people who have been using uh, Docker in production. And uh, I think maybe we're one of the, one of the oldest, I think. Um, I can officially say we've been running Docker in production for over a year now. Um, so I'm going to go through examples. And I think the coolest thing that I found from like meetups is how are you using it? Where are you using it? Right? Um, not necessarily too much of the technical details. But um, you can also find me at, uh, on, on Twitter, just John Fiedler. Uh, it's just my name. So if you want to reach out and you have any questions, uh, feel free. So kind of the agenda, I want to talk about some of the timeline. So I think this is really cool, and I hope uh, you will as well. Where we do use Docker, and then also in our infrastructure, where we don't use Docker. Um, and I think still a lot of problems to be solved is operational standards that around Docker. How do you deploy? How do you update? How do you secure it? Um, how we do things. I think there's a lot of innovation that um, still is needed. And then uh, things that we've just run into over the last year. So go ahead and get started. Um, this is the timeline. Uh, from what we've done with Docker. So we actually started with Docker uh, in our dev environment. And if you're just starting out, um, I highly recommend to do this first. This, is, this has been one of the awesomest projects that we did. There's a blog post on this um, that we started. This was done in 2013 Q4. Um, and what we did in 24 hours is essentially take our entire dev environment uh, and mash it into containers using linking. And then uh, we replaced our old scripts and things. Uh, and now it's 100% Docker. And we are still using that today with bash scripts. Um, not fig yet, um, actually. Um, so we're still using that today. Uh, a couple other things that we did was um, why Docker, why not Chef? We actually wrote a, a colleague of mine wrote a, a blog post like why 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 do we even need Chef? And it turns out you know a year later, um, looking back at this article, uh, it's really interesting. We actually replaced um, what Chef was doing for us. We think it's three things. Uh, you know, there's the orchestration which we don't really like to use uh, for it. Uh, we also don't like to do deployments with it. But uh, Chef is really really amazing at configuration uh, management, and we still use that today. Um, the single most important project on this timeline was continuous deployment in Team City. Uh, this is this leveraged us to do so much more with Docker to actually build Docker containers in a CI CD faction. Uh, we use Team City today. We call it Docker and Docker in house because it's you know you have a Docker <laughs> container side loads another Docker machine to actually do the builds and deploys and then pushes, uh, which has been pretty fun. Um, right after that, we got our entire uh, so right in I think. Tail end of January last year, um, every single web request that Relate.IQ has delivered has been running in a Docker container. So I think it was right at the tail end of January. Um, we launched a new, uh, I have a slide on this too, um, all of our web machines across production, staging, um, and I'll, something called Docker Mirror 2 uh, is actually running as a web container. So I could, so after a year, um, every single web request has been delivered by Docker, which is awesome. And we do it with zero downtime deployments. And I have an example for that as well. Um, quickly after that, we realized what not to do with Docker. Um, that was actually build a full stack container with Azkaban. It's a Hadoop job scheduler that is a web server. It's an executor that actually runs the job and a MySQL database. We stored all that inside of a container. There's a lot to be <laughs> learned from that actually example. And then um, Q2. Uh, we launched Mesos, so we actually tried out CoreOS, um, we tried out Fleet, uh, we weren't too happy with it at the time, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, we, what we found and sticked with was Mesos, and that's actually been really, really powerful for us. From there, we, uh, you can find some of those previous talks, we talked at DockerCon, um, if you saw us there. But we run every single integration off uh, that's uh, either run in Python or anything outside of Java, runs off Mesos in and in Docker containers. Um, so that's pretty awesome inside production. The other thing is our main website uh, also, since we found really, really good success with running our production infrastructure, um, we just put everything that's web-based inside containers. Uh, our public websites, our staging websites, um, anything corporate. And now we're actually running this on Beanstalk. So uh, using Amazon's Beanstalk service using Docker, we deploy them all 100% with um, containers and using Docker on there off Beanstalk. The other cool things that we've just recently done, we found really 
uh, amazing is the DevOps CLI. So all you ops guys out there, I really, uh, I'm gonna show you something really cool. And then Docker Me is uh, the latest thing where we're kind of getting rid of staging Canary and Prod as data, we're only treating them as data sources. So most companies have staging web servers that point to staging um, data, and then they have Canary web servers, and then they have Prod web servers, and it's very vertical. We're actually getting rid of the top section any branch that we deploy with Team City can actually create its own container. So if there's a developer that has a brand new web UI, or there's another developer who wants to have their own new billing system with different integrations, each one of those spawn up, and we can point the backend data source to staging or Canary or Prod. So it kind of changes the model a little bit, and that's been a really cool project that we did. Hopefully I'll have a blog post for you guys soon. Um, if you look across the infrastructure, the green here is actually where we fully run Docker. Where we don't run Docker is the red, and somewhat Docker is actually on the right. I'm going to walk through this. Today, um, production, I just did the research, it's 65% uh, full Docker containers today. So when we create containers, so when developers need to push code, um, the dev environment, which there's a lot of blog posts here, we took our entire infrastructure and put them all in Docker containers, linked them all together. When a new hire joins our company, they're able to push the production within one hour. That's uh, because you can just hit a button, your infrastructure loads, it preloads all the data very fast, and they can commit right to um, the gravy train, right to prod, which is great. But the new thing that I want to talk about today is the ops guys in this room, your environment is getting very, very complex, almost as complex as developers. Um, you have to run Chef, you have to run Knife, you have to run Git, you got Burke Shelf now, you got all the Amazon CLIs, you have Fabric, Test Kitchen, these are Ruby. I know you guys love Ruby and they, don't, they never have issues. Uh, we also have scripts too, like Python scripts or Bash scripts that we own. So it's getting really, really complex to actually house all this. What we did was we, we didn't want to take care of the developer all the time. We actually took a moment for ourselves and focused on the ops guys and we actually created all of our ops tools into a single container. So now when an ops guy gets hired and they need to push and create web servers or a new server inside Amazon, they can actually join the company, set up their Knife RB and their credentials once they get in, uh, hit DevOps-CLI, gets them inside this container. Now all these tools listed here are all set up, pointed to where they need to be. Um, so we've taken that time for ops guys uh, along with developers. And now anyone that joins on an engineering side can be up and running in an hour. So it's been really powerful. We actually think there's a lot of uh, innovation that can happen inside your ops containers. Like for instance, what are all the ops guys running? Um, you can, if you centralize this in a container, you can have that written to a database. And now you can actually search that with Elasticsearch, whatnot. And essentially, um, Anything running here, now you can see and react and then you can audit, which is great. Uh, where we deploy, so Team City, we use again. This used to run in Docker. All the agents used to run in Docker. So every web server that we ran was uh, built with Docker in Docker, deploying Docker containers. Um, the code types that we've used is Java, PHP, Python, Ruby, um, you name it. Uh, everything runs in Docker, which is why I really, really love it. Any engineer can use whatever code they want. You don't have to centralize on one. You can use whatever uh, suits you as a, as a developer to be the most productive developer you can. Um, the other thing is we use a Docker private registry. We don't use um, a lot of Docker Hub, and I'll get into that in a little second. So quickly, I'll go through how we run zero downtime with Docker, which is one of the best projects. We actually run Hipache, which is a Redis-backed database web server that can switch uh, hosts real time. And what we do is we use Ubuntu, and we deploy down just the base images still with Chef. Uh, everything else is deployed through Team City and scripts on top of that. Uh, we actually have a script, just a shell script still, very small, just checks in for pin builds or automatic new builds that are successful in Team City um, every minute. And every minute, if it finds a new container, it just goes ahead and pulls that container, loads it up side by side in the web app. Then our container will um, show a health check once it's up and running. And once that's healthy, the load balancer will see that and it'll automatically redirect, causing zero downtime for web machines. And then it'll go ahead and take down 
tear down the old uh, container along with that. Uh, we used to have a lot of problems with this when the RM function, I believe I mentioned earlier, uh, doesn't actually remove your Docker containers and your whole host fills up or you have thousands of dead images around. Um, we ran into that quite a bit in the earlier year, but then we got smart about running dot containers, just kill them off or just spin off new uh, hosts. Uh, it was really, really easy. This has been really powerful for us. Um, again, every single web request that runs at Roulette IQ is powered by a Docker container. Where we run our, all our middleware is at Mesos. Um, this, this is really powerful just because it does all your cron scheduling. You don't need to run cron jobs in Linux anymore. You can run all these uh, little scripts from ops guys inside Mesos. We have probably like 100 scripts. Uh, go and snapshot a machine. Go and copy a snapshot from US East to US West. Um, all these little scripts, we don't need to run in these uh, systems anymore. You can just write one-offs, create a little container, just deploy it to Mesos, and then never worry about it. Uh, it's also great because it has health checks, auto restarts, auto failures. Uh, it'll, you know, if it does fail, it'll auto rebuild it. Um, port and server discovery. It's not service discovery. That still needs to be solved today. Console is what we're looking at, probably using in the future. Um, it is your grid computer and your microservices. Like this, this just powers all your SOA um, infrastructure. And this is where essentially we're going in the future. Um, but I think there's a lot of innovation that still needs to happen. What I always come back to and what I think about at night is, why is there no vSphere yet for Docker containers? I know that VMs are not containers and vice versa, but why can't I see it, all the containers running in my infrastructure and what their health checks are? I think that's going to come soon. And I think uh, you see Flocker and you see all, all the virtualization, all the networking here. It's going to happen. And I think it's going to probably happen end of this year. You're going to see some really cool stuff. So that's 100% also running in Docker containers. Where we don't run containers is our persistent layer. We've always been fearful of running containers. Um, and there's a couple reasons for this. We run into weird ownership issues. When, when you're you know, running as root on the box, and then your container is starting up through MySQL, MySQL is the owner, and then you have a different owner on your host, everything runs through root. Um, once you change these, or somebody, a junior admin will log into the box and change their ownership. Uh, we see really weird things. I've also run containers, and the actual ownership will change between the processes actually running them underneath. Uh, I haven't figured it out. Maybe someone in the room knows, but uh, it's just really odd. It, it happened with MySQL for us. And, you know, we are tending to use more databases of service. So RDS, if you're familiar on the Amazon platform, supports uh, your mic. MySQL and Postgres. It's super easy and you can script them in Chef just to launch a little micro uh, databases wherever you need in your service-oriented architecture that we haven't had actually the need um, to run Docker containers for these. And then Cassandra uh, and Mongo and newly what well, we're starting to go with uh, Foundation DB as well. We, we like that full on uh, hardcore database to bare metal aspect and nothing in between. Um, we ran a roadblock in the middle of the year last year where we were going to start using containers in the persistence layer. But as the Flocker guys here um, have solved, that, that wasn't solved last year. We just hit a roadblock where we couldn't, we couldn't move on and, and innovate inside that space. So we just said, all right, let's wait. Let's wait for the innovation. This will come pretty soon. Um, I think this will all be solved. And you know, I'm really, really excited. My next stack today, I'll probably be using Flocker um, to try this out. But Swarm, Mesos, CoreOS, Kubernetes, and even the EC2 container service are going to be all hot in this market, I think. Um, so it's going to be really, really fun to see. And I think this problem will be solved within uh, this year. And then lastly, and across our infrastructure, uh, operation standards that we use, uh, it's still really messy, uh, I feel. Um, there's just so much innovation in so many disparate systems. No one's really using like a central API for all this stuff. Um, so we actually still use a lot of shell scripts, to be honest. Uh, Team City does all our deployments. We've automated it with Beanstalk. So if a developer pushes in new web code, goes to Team City, Team City actually updates a bucket inside S3. And then S3, um, Beanstalk will actually monitor that S3 bucket for new changes and auto-deploy and pull your container all for you. It's magical. Um, so we really, really like that aspect, but no one else has been able to done that, do that uh, from end to end, uh, in our opinions. Um, we still use Docker's uh, Chef Cookbook, which is uh, pretty decent, um, but it's really just one container to one host. And then Mesos. 
we've kind of solved the monitoring problem with um, we feel at least our, our needs. Um, it's just statsd out of the application. So anything running in your containers just sends statsds out. And then the host level, uh, we just use Datadog and also StatsD for any metrics. Um, this has been really, really beneficial because Datadog is a StatsD client with an, a pretty amazing dashboard for us. So end-to-end, -end, all your map metrics, your server metrics, and system level metrics are all in one dashboard. Um, so we haven't had to do anything there. We our our, our <laughs> now. Um, taking these Datadog um, containers and agents and running them side-carded or linked into the, uh, whatever service you have. So this is kind of <laughs> where we have them inside Docker, but most of them are still on the hosts. Logging, I think um, this is easy for us too. Any containers always write to the host um, or an S3 bucket, and both of those get consumed by Sumo Logic agents. Sumo Logic can see uh, logs from an S3 bucket, and then they can also see it from the host. And then security, um, this is pretty interesting. We have a really low host, uh, as there mentioned, long container runs. We don't spin up a ton of them. Um, so it's a really low container to host ratio. And then Team City Mesos deploys, um, it's always continuously updated. And then scan log D, it's actually like a, a host security scanner if we're getting pen tested. Um, these will fire off alerts. These are all running inside uh, containers as well. And I think this is a new uh, environment that's going to be great, uh, is security and running containers wherever you need them on any type of systems uh, provide awesome like IDS. So lastly, um, things that we found, device mapper, device mapper, device mapper kills us all the time. Um, and it's, it just fills up the disk. We have unhung uh, processes where we can't um, unmount those uh, at all. Sometimes we just have to blow away the machine. Mesos and Device Mapper don't get along a lot. We'll see at random times uh, it won't be doing anything and 100% uh, IOU till all the time. Um, so it's just it's a little refreshing, but the nice thing is there's health checks and things just re reboot and it's easy to deploy new ones. Um, the registry, so what we found is the early in the year Private registry was really unstable, um, so we ended up moving to Quay.io. Um, this is before Docker Hub came out, and then we ended up moving back. They fixed the private, which we're really excited about. We just run pretty much everything from CD, CI, CD inside uh, their own Docker container with the private registry, and we use Docker Hub for anything that we open source. The security, so one thing that we found, the ghost vulnerability in Shellshock last year, probably everyone here has been going through, um, your containers have OSs too, and libraries, and um, bugs and vulnerabilities. You have to patch these as well, not just your hosts. And if you don't have a good CI CD system, it's really hard to go ahead and patch all those and even find them. Um, root, uh, I'm not really as concerned as uh, kind of the community here, but since we have a low container to host ratio, um, Mesos authentication, and just authentication for any open source system, please put in authentication. Uh, I see a lot of new projects and people just start using them and there's no auth, um, you, there's no group, there's no LDAP auth. Um, so it's really, really hard sometimes to secure that. We have to put a lot in, fr in front of like uh, HTTP proxies with auth. And then keys, what do you do with keys? Like on Beanstalk, for instance, we don't hold, we don't, we don't run the instance, so we had to find a whole new way to deploy keys. We used to use Chef data bags, um, and now we have to have new solutions. So this is a really cool uh, area, to, I think, to innovate. And then lastly, container types. Lightweight is great. Op scripts are pretty awesome. Um, what I mean by lightweight is a lot of people suggest to run Docker containers one process at a time. And then full stack, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's really hard to migrate off if you're containing um, SQL databases and executions and web servers all together. When you try and scale that out, you have to figure out how you're going to decouple all those components. And you're going to have to typically rewrite it. Um, so what we found is just start small, uh, use linking where we can uh, as, as much as we can. And that's it. Any questions? How do we deal with data migration? It's great. So we don't use Docker and persistence layer. So most of all of our containers that run inside Mesos or Beanstalk, um, they typically always go back and talk to a single or uh, another database. And those don't run. So we never need to migrate that data. They're essentially, we run containers as ephemeral. So they can die, they can stop, uh, we can start them up wherever we want, and they'll always point back to the data. But 
um, as you scale out systems, you can't really, s you can only get to a point where you can scale up. So we know we're going to have to tackle this year, but we haven't had to yet. And that's why I'm really, really excited about like Cluster HQ and Flocker. Yeah, question was patching. How do we deal with it? Um, especially with the ghost vulnerability. Um, Salesforce actually joining that team is one of the most impressive security teams out there where they are like, you need to patch all, every single one of your systems, every single container within like a week. Uh, we need to remediate this fast. What we found was actually our, our Docker containers were running Ubuntu 12 and that was vulnerable. Um, but the nice thing was is we had our Git repo and we can change that base image to Ubuntu 14 and then Team City would essentially see that base image and any new forward facing container that we built was all just replaced. Um, so essentially in one day we just replaced any container uh, with new updated versions. Now on our hosts we just had to go out run Chef. Um, but the, the weird thing about Ghost vulnerability, for instance, you had to reboot your machine. Uh, you couldn't just run Yum might update and patch them. Right? You had to reboot the machine because so many things were uh, coupled with that library. Um, so we had to run, reboot every single host. But the nice thing was, uh, I think for us, Beanstalk, it auto scales. So if you kill one, it'll just auto uh, start up a new one. Mesos does the same exact thing. If you start a, a drone or a master, there's enough infrastructure today where we didn't have a single piece of downtime when we rebooted our entire infrastructure. Um, but to answer your question, it was Team City really saved us, and having Docker containers built in a CI CD fashion really went a long way for us there. Yes, the uh, question was, since we have a really low container to host ratio, why not just blow away the host and then use like, for instance, Chef. Um, Chef actually has a Docker uh, cookbook that you can say, I want this container running on this host. Um, just do it how the roles and environments work. And th the answer is for us, we don't use it a lot. Um, the only things that we use is Kafka in that case where we will, K Kafka and Mesos. Mesos with the device mapper issues will um, essentially go to 100% IO where we can't even SSH in the machines. We just go to Amazon, terminate them, and then we just hit use knife and spin up a new box. Um, so we're actually doing that today. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot though um, for us. We don't have a lot of issues with Docker. It's more around the orchestration pieces that actually break for us and cause many issues. Um, where I can see a lot of the infrastructure is going today is microservices and service oriented architecture having all these little containers and that's the best way to run um, containers in our opinion. We're getting there but um, we haven't needed to. Uh, our architectures were running monolithic at, at first. So we're actually starting to spawn these out. And Mesos has really been the answer for us in that area. So how do we do communication between the microservices? Um, everything from a persistence layer goes back to these clusters that pretty much just stay there. They don't really move a lot. Um, between the containers, they're a lot, they're really isolated. They don't have to talk between them. Uh, it's more like web service or a customer comes through, um, it processes, goes to the database and gives a request back. Another, it doesn't really have to talk to too many different services. Um, what we found though is like Zookeeper is a like service discovery and just storing state. Um, those things will run in containers and those will actually communicate. But since we have a low container host ratio, we'll actually use Zookeeper since we can scale those up and then it, we can fan them out. We run those uh, one container per host. So we, all the, the services don't need to find each other and go through this complicated orchestration with service discovery. Um, we actually just point them to the host and we know that these three are gonna be there and their uptimes are like, you know, two years. Um, so, but I think Next year, we want to get rid of that model and actually put them inside Mesos. Or we think that console and other um, service discovery mechanisms out there are getting pretty mature, and a lot of people have been successful. So we're going to, I think, jump in pretty soon. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.